term rabbi really was a second temple term that really came from the reformation of Ezra when they came out of Babylon and then they restored that temple you know with um, Nehemiah and Ezra so they set up the system of teachers when Ezra brought the law out and it created this great repentance and reformation they set up uh, systems of teachers and so they set up the synagogues which was these basically community centers and uh, men that were wealthy that uh, had great uh, produce and wealth were able to in their leisure time be able to have disciples and these disciples would come and live at their home or stay with them and then they would provide shelter and food and then they would instruct them in the law so the term rabbi was a second temple term for the systems of uh, like community teachers and they afforded really great uh, respect and honor you know so there's a lot that was to being a rabbi you know like for example um, a rabbi was somebody that you didn't even immediately judge if there was something questionable that you saw because they may be for example when Christ was speaking uh, to the woman at the well it said that they didn't question him as to why he was speaking to that woman number one should he be speaking to a non-jew should he be speaking to a woman this is a woman getting water at noontime so she's under special condemnation because she can't go in the morning or in the evening where the other women are she's an outcast so it was a questionable circumstance in which christ was speaking to the syrophoenician woman but because he was a rabbi it says that they didn't question him Maybe somebody came and brought him food. That was kind of the duty of the disciples, you know, in that way. So there's a lot of rabbinic kind of pictures happening in the uh, New Testament, in which Christ gets his disciples and he travels around with them. And there's a, a, they afford a lot of respect for the rabbi. Like, for example, you know, what's fascinating about the rabbi culture and kind of how they set it up is that since the second temple had a prophetic uh, emphasis to it, a prophetic reality to it from the book of Daniel, that they knew that the Messiah was going to come to that temple, that the glory of that temple wasn't so much of the great building structure as Solomon's temple. Solomon's temple was known for its great glory and grandeur and beauty and the aesthetic beauty that it had. But this temple was, quote, a lesser temple, but it was greater in its glory that the Messiah would come to this temple because of the time prophecies of Daniel. So the book of Mark, which is the first gospel, that was the first gospel ever written, it, the first account of the life of Christ is Peter's account speaking through John Mark. And John Mark recording all of this, it starts out in this is the fulfillment of the time. And the time that they were talking about is the time of Daniel in which there was this uh, very um, large public knowledge that the Messiah was going to come to that temple and it was prophetically in time that was the time for that messiah to come so this is a picture that christ is the one that has come to his temple suddenly that malachi talked about and john the baptist had prepared the way as virtually in elijah in other words he's going to run before the king and give the great announcement that the messiah is coming well christ came to a very fascinating climate and that is the rabbinic society and the rabbinic society is one in which it is a teacher class society in other words it was filled with synagogues and teachers and so it was a scholastic climate so that's why even like for example when christ they had said uh, well he didn't go to any schools how does he know what he knows and the fact that nathaniel when uh, you know jesus uh, came for uh, getting, collecting disciples. Nathaniel had heard that he came from Nazareth. And the question was, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? What well, was in concept of the schools? It was a small place that had no reputation for his school. Not like um, Tarsus, a place where like Saul came from. You know, those were notorious for great teachers, you know, Gamaliel and people like that. But Nazareth had nothing. It was a, it was a Galilean town in which had these kind of uh, more rougher style uh, teachers, you know, that were kind of uh, known more for a blue collar fisherman 
you know, carpenter, stuff like that. And the fact that Jesus was a carpenter all the way up, he didn't come from any school. And that was the whole idea. They immediately identified the fact that we know who your father is, that you're the son of Joseph, and that you came from Nazareth, and that you're a carpenter. So you came from no school. You didn't come from the rabbinic scholastic society. So how could you have been taught? And they really believed that these rabbis, these people, ultimately the Sanhedrin, the, 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 the great assembly of the 70, that if you didn't come from them, there is no way you can have the great oral tradition insight that Moses' 70 elders had. So that you weren't a part of the, um, the apostolic pass down, you know, the succession of the 70 elders. So Christ obviously was set at odds with this scholastic rabbinic society that was there with the synagogues that were so essential in Ezra's reform that if you were removed or kicked out of the synagogue, you wouldn't even have vocation, wouldn't have status in society. So it was very much of kind of like today, you know, where they have, you know, basically a uh, academic class of society that where'd your degree come from? You know, uh, let's look at your resume. It was a big resume society, you know, in that way. So uh, John and Andrew, when they first saw Christ, they, they asked, uh, they called him rabbi. They said, where do you stay, rabbi? Where do you so, stay? So how did they know that he was a rabbi since he didn't go to any of those schools? Why did they acknowledge him as a, as a teacher? As a rabbi, as a teacher? Well, yeah, Jesus basically uh, got his credentials from the identity of John the Baptist. John was the one that pointed out Christ and says, this is the one. He must increase, I must decrease. This is the one that I've been speaking about. And so that's why, like, for example, when uh, they were coming against Christ and they were saying, where do you get your authority from? So Jesus said, well, where did John the Baptist get his authority from? In other words, I got basically the hand on the shoulder and the other finger pointing to me from John the Baptist. So whatever the authority of John the Baptist, where that came from, is the same authority that I'm getting it from since he, in fact, did the laying on of hands of me and baptism and an identifying of me. And literally those two disciples, John and Andrew, were disciples of John. And John had passed that on and saying, okay, he's the one, follow him. And so they went, when they went up to Jesus, they said, let us stay with you. Know, where are you staying? Because you would stay with the rabbi. Well, this rabbi was a rabbi that had no home. You know, the birds have their nests and the fox have their holes, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. Now, the rabbinic society, you know, it was a big deal to stay in this rich man's home, to live in his rooms, you know, to be fed by. They even discouraged the wives and the daughters being around the young disciples in these homes, that they would have male servants such as John Mark kind of played that role of the young male servants because they didn't want anyone to be distracted with females. It was kind of interesting to have Mary Magdalene, you know, being a, a, around and the women that were kind of a part of the scene that was very much what have brought reproach to the ministry of a rabbi. What was fascinating is that even rabbis, you weren't even allowed to know where they bathed, where they uh, went to the bathroom or anything like that. You, you weren't allowed to know those things. You weren't allowed to see their, quote, nakedness. So it was very fascinating that Christ kept his disciples with him wherever he went. And he kept three, fundamentally, that were with him no matter what he did. Even if he is clawing at the ground and praying, you know, to his father in a prayer closet, he kept his three with him. So it's very fascinating really how Christ goes into a rabbinic society, into a scholastic society, into a reform of the law society that was inaugurated through the rebuilding of the second temple through Ezra and the reforms that were there that were to point to the Messiah that would come up and that would rise up through the people and the law would point to him and identify and testify of him. So it's very fascinating that really the the life of Christ really came up through rabbinic society, you know, and that he was such a uh, different class of rabbi because he distinguished himself by the fact that he was not himself rabbi. That is what's so fascinating. There is no rabbinic uh, succession that happened with Christ. He communed directly with the Father.
That's what's so powerful and fascinating. In fact, his first public um, teaching was going into a synagogue, and then he reads Isaiah, which Isaiah was a big part of the Second Temple language because they knew that the um, Goel, or the representative, or this Mashiach, this Messiah, would come in and would end up being the heroic Israel. He would come and be, you know, like David was for, you know, in fighting the Philistines with Goliath, he was going to go and represent the entire nation. So this Messiah was going to be a Goel, in other words, one who would go in place and fight for everybody. And so it's very fascinating that Jesus comes in and he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, you know, and basically identifying himself in a synagogue, in a rabbinic society, and saying that this is fulfilled in your ears today. So immediately he was throwing the entire system into crises where they were actually going to try to throw him off a cliff right there in the synagogue, you know, so.